Hey everyone, welcome back to Who's There. I'm your host, Allison. If you're new here, thank you for joining us. If you're returning, thank you for coming back. This is a podcast where I talk to a new horror fan every week because I hope to destigmatize what it means to be a horror movie fan because most of us are just regular people who like the adrenaline rush of being scared for some reason. And here we delve into those reasons. So I'm so excited this week because we have actor, writer, consultant, stylist, and social media star George Hahn on the podcast. I first came across George on Twitter earlier this year during COVID when he started making hilarious political satire videos about what a quote unquote war zone our neighborhood and New York City are respectively. Spoiler alert, they're not. Stop watching Fox News. But then it turned out that he's also a horror fan and I was thrilled when he agreed to come on the pod and speak with me. He's a lover of the classics like The Omen and the original Halloween. His parents started him young when they took him to see The Shining when he was only nine. He talks about why he thinks Friday the 13th, the first one, is the only movie in that series with a realistic plot. He was quite passionate about the movie Friday the 13th, so I was going to try to launch this episode last Friday, but I already had Matt Blasey's episode lined up and ready to go. We also talked about the original When a Stranger Falls, and last night I got around to watching the original with Carol Kane, and I actually really enjoyed it. This might surprise some people because I am not known for liking horror movies that were made before the 90s, but I actually really enjoyed it. I'm excited for you to hear our conversation, so let's get into it. Hey George, how are you? I'm great, Allison. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for being here. How was your Halloween? My Halloween was, um, I mean, quieter than usual. You know, we didn't have our parade situation downtown, of course, but it was really fun to see some parents getting very creative with their kids. And there was trick-or-treating. I don't know about your part of the neighborhood, but I, there was some trick-or-treating happening in the stores that were open, that are open, had candy and stuff. And it was all very, I, I was I guess what my big takeaway was that I was glad that there was something for kids to do. There was some kind of semblance of Halloween for them. And um, for myself, I watched the double feature, of course, of John Carpenter's Halloween from 1978, followed by David Gordon Green's 2018 sequel. That's awesome. What did you think of the 2018 version? I thought it was good. I thought it was really good. Um, in the sense that it picked up, I I always hated the middle sequels, you know, from Halloween 2 and what was it, 79 or 80. From then on, I thought they were terrible. I didn't mind, oh gosh, this is terrible. I'm I'm blanking on his name, who did the uh, the remakes, one and two um, in the earlier aughts. Thank you, Rob Zombie. I thought Rob spent a little too much time in, in the second act of like, Michael Myers' background and stuff. I just thought, okay, let's just get out of the mental hospital and move on with the story. That's a long answer to your question. I liked the 2018 movie. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, there was definitely trick-or-treating going on. Uh, My boyfriend and I walked down from where I live to about 72nd, and a lot of people in Brownstones made homemade um, candy shoots Mm -hmm. out their windows, so they would just shoot out candy to kids. So it was very (laughs) There was going down Columbus Avenue. I kid you not, it was awesome in the bike lane some guy had tricked out like a long bike like a cargo bike to look like a ghost ship and he was riding the ghost ship and behind him were there was someone on a bicycle and someone on a scooter and someone on i think there were like four in this little convoy in the bike lane in great like there was a zombie costume there was a skeleton costume and they had michael jackson's thriller blasting on the stereo and they were dancing like as much as one can dance on a scooter. There was a rollerblader in this crew. It was hilarious. That's and I awesome. said, please do a lap and circle around the neighborhood again because it was such a fun display. It was pretty brilliant, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I yeah. Somebody, come, somebody post a video of it on Twitter. Please. Yeah. So I know from reading your website that you grew up in Cleveland and you went to Boston College for theater and from Instagram, I know that you have two adorable dogs. Aside from all of that, what else should people know about you before we talk about why you love horror movies? Oh my gosh, what should people know about me? Uh, Let's see, I was an actor. I still consider myself an actor. I haven't worked professionally in years, but I still have my Screen Actors Guild card. Um, Did some television there when I came to New York and a little bit of theater, nothing near Broadway at all, like remotely near it, Um, and a movie under my belt. And hmm, what else do I want people to know about me? I like 
well, you'd get this from my blog, but um, I'm not one for athleisure, although these are casual times, but I, I, I have a job where I get to wear a suit and tie and not because I have to, because I enjoy it. So I like, uh, I like dressing nicely. I'm a nerd that way. I am my father's son. <laughs> <laughs> well, that nothing to be ashamed about. So I know you're a horror movie fan because you kept everyone up to date on your social media about what horror movie you were watching every day in October. Um, yeah. Like, first things first, what's your favorite scary movie? Oh, such a scream question. Um, probably if I had to answer off the top of my head, what comes to mind first would be The Shining. Okay. It's such a complex, multi-layered uh, horror movie. I'm also, I, I still love Psycho. Uh, it still works for me. Yeah, that's what comes off the top of my head. Awesome. So you really love the classics. I do, I do but I also love, there are some modern ones that have come up, uh, I would say, in the last 10 years. There have been some really good ones in every decade, I think. There's some great modern horror. What is the great modern horror that you've seen lately? Um, I think the most solid horror movie in the last 10 years that I've seen might be The Conjuring. Um, I do like that universe. I think it's very, I think it's really good storytelling. I think it's well produced. I think the casting, the performances all, you know, all around, I think they're pretty great. Uh, there was a movie I saw during, uh, I think in the last couple of months and Allison, you might have to help me. I can't remember the title of it, but it was a very low budge lockdown kind of a movie that happened that took place like on zoom. Host. With these, ho yes. I thought that was so clever. It's and just so good. So clever, so resourceful. And I thought, what a great use of the current time we're in. And I'm sure they had like $5 in their budget. And they just did such a great job with it. I was really impressed with that. Yeah, no, I love that. I've seen that twice. And it was just as effective the second time. Mm -hmm. It's all, It was like Unfriended, yes. but very of the moment. Yes, it was very appropriate, especially for when the two girls, one girl goes to the other girl's apartment at the end and they, you know, do the, the arm tap. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Did you see the trailer for the new Michael Bay movie that's coming out soon about a pandemic in the world and it's the 213th week of lockdown? No. Oh, I'll, <gasps> I'll send it to you. It All looks, right, please do. Yeah, it looks intense, and the virus in that movie has already started to mutate, so they're having trouble controlling it again. Too soon. It's just too soon. Wow. Okay. My, 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 my trepidation with that is that Michael Bay always just goes so big. It's so big. Like, he just doesn't... I, there's, I don't think Michael Bay has a, a gift for nuance or subtlety. Yeah, the movie does look very big. Yeah, he's, he's shooting for Rosie. Always is. So I was looking at the list of movies that laid the foundation for the types of movies um, mm -hmm. that you sent me earlier, and it's a study in the classics, like I said. How did these movies make you fall in love with the horror genre? Oh, that's such a good question. For the people listening, um, I sent Allison. Not that, I don't think you even asked. I just want to send it to you. It's a list of movies. When I was growing up, like my formative years, because I came of age, I was born in 1970, and I came of age when home video started to become a thing with first the Betamax and then the VHS player. And then there were stores, this is way pre-Blockbuster, where you could go and rent, these were local mom and pop shops where you could rent home videos. And I think maybe the first horror movie I saw might have been like the televised, edited version of Halloween. And then I wanted to see like the real one. I wanted to see like the uncut, like R-rated grown-up one for people like, you know, ages 17 or over. I was only eight when that movie came out, but I was obsessed with that. I was, it was, it was so thrilling that something on the screen could terrify you and make your heart beat fast and sort of jab at my fears. And I wanted more. I always so wanted more. And then, mind you, The Shining came out in 1980. I was 10. Well, I turned, my birthday's late in the year. I was nine. My parents took me to see that in the theater. So, and that was a different kind of, that's not a, it's not a slasher kind of a horror movie. I don't even really think Halloween is. There's very little blood in it. Definitely a slasher, but The Shining is more psychological. Definitely. You're right. You're right. Yeah. The Halloween kind of, yeah. I love it when people call it bloody and gory. It's like, actually, no, I think they maybe used one gallon at most. 
I watched the original Halloween for the first time back in 2018 before I saw the remake. And I was like, this is so tame. Why does everyone think this is so scary? But mm. when it came out, it was the first of its kind. So. I can tell you why. And what was scary about Halloween, I grew up in a suburb very similar to the fictional Hall Haddonfield, Illinois. And my trick or I had babysitters and there was trick or treating and all of that, like all that. I identified with that. And it was the first time unexplained murderous evil had visited the suburbs. And it was in broad daylight. You know, there's Michael Myers stalking somebody in a stolen station wagon. There's Michael Myers popping up from behind a hedge, standing in a backyard with clothes drying on the line in broad daylight and terrifying. It wasn't at night. It wasn't in a haunted house. There was nothing supernatural happening. This was stuff. What was scary about it is that this was American, this was American suburbia where you are supposed to be safe and everything's supposed to be all right. And everything was not all right. That's what was so uh, groundbreaking about it. It wasn't at a remote hotel on a rainy night off a highway like Psycho. This was in like broad daylight in the middle of nice people, very white people, suburbia, you know, and that was terrifying. Yeah, you mentioned that when you were little, you were always afraid that you were going to see a Michael Myers type guy stalking you on your way home from school. Totally. So, yeah, I guess that's from having watched it at age eight. Because my walk to, like, I went to St. Luke's School in Lakewood, and my walk around that block was very, like, it was very Laurie Strode. It was like Laurie Strode's walk to school. So, um, yeah, I was always terrified to go down Chase Lane and look down the lane. Is there somebody coming in the other direction? Yeah. <sighs> Uh, did movie. nothing like that ever happen, though? No. Well, what you were saying before about horror coming to the suburbs, that is exactly why John Carpenter wrote Halloween. There's a podcast called Unmasked, which is all about, I think it's an eight or nine part series, all about the making of Halloween and mm -hmm. how it came to be. And that's exactly what ah. the host said that yeah. John Carpenter said. So Yeah. And they another thing, shot on a shoestring. I mean, like, I know, like, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis has told stories about how they were all helping like m move lights and cables. And I do love, I don't know, you saw Halloween for the first time only a couple years ago? Yeah. Have you seen some of the glaring errors in it? I haven't. What are they? Oh. <laughs> Spoiler alert, but everyone's probably seen it. But um, in the very opening scene, that is one long shot. And that was the first time anybody had used a steady cam to that degree. So it starts in the front yard of the Myers house from young six-year-old Michael's point of view, goes around the side of the house, looks in the window, goes into the back door, kitchen, through the house, up the stairs, and then kills his sister. There is one cut in there. I think it's when he's at the top of the stairs. But anyway, the when he goes along the side of the house on the front porch, you can see a stack of light cables, like between the bushes. And then they had to get them out of... You know, they're because they're a crew, like whenever the camera's not on something, there's crew like moving stuff, like moving furniture and cables and stuff to position it so that the guy, the cameraman could walk through and, you know, nothing technical could be seen. Mm, that's yeah. really interesting. And then when the, um, oh, when Michael Myers is standing behind the bush and Laurie sees him and then Annie runs up and says, you know, basically says, you know, there's nobody here or whatever. No, she says, um, you know, oh, there's someone here who wants to talk to you. She's teasing her. You can see John Carpenter's cigarette smoke floating across the screen because <laughs> he's a chain smoker. Smokes oh. so much that he couldn't keep it out of the final cut. And you can also see palm trees in it. It's supposed to be Illinois. It was shot in California. Yeah, I think I remember seeing palm trees in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But nonetheless, I, you know, it does not to take away from the fun because as a good horror movie, I think it's in, in terms of structure, it's just near perfect. And every other slasher movie that came after it tried to do the same thing. Yeah, it was just basically copying. I know you love Friday the 13th as well. Only the first one. Okay. Here's the thing. That movie gets such a bum rap for being a cheap and cheesy Halloween knockoff. Like it adheres to this formula of take young people, teenagers, isolate them, put them, you know, remove any connection to help and put them in danger. You know, that's kind of the formula. But what I loved about Friday the 13th and none of the sequels, I hate, I am not, I am a big horror fan, but the whole Jason Voorhees things never worked for me, ever. I never bought it. I thought it was stupid. Uh, so what, this kid lived underwater <laughs> or lived in the woods after he drowned, but didn't drown? Like, the story's unclear. What I liked about Friday the 13th was that it's, it was, Friday the 13th is actually possible. Like, that can actually happen in reality. 
you know, a mother with her, I would imagine Mrs. Voorhees is like a single mother working at this camp. What was she was the cook, I think. And she had one son and he was had some challenges. No, he was he was um, handicapped in a way. I guess he had mental challenges. The boy, as the story goes, and they probably just let Jason be at the camp out of niceness because there's this woman cooking for the kids. Anyway, so she's probably a little unhinged and maybe a divorcee or a widow. We don't know. I'm going deep here. <laughs> Keep going. And then her boy drowns because nobody was paying attention, and she snaps, and she's furious. And she doesn't, she comes, becomes completely unhinged and sabotages every attempt to reopen this camp after that accident. And then there is an attempt to actually reopen it and she's not going to let it happen. Like, I believe that. Like, that is believable. That a woman, a single mother, who was already maybe a little not altogether there, went completely crazy and homicidal. Yeah. Like, I, I, be, I believe that. Yeah. So, and that's more terrifying to me. A really, that, that woman is more terrifying to me than this fictitious superhero zombie character that is Jason or whatever he's supposed to be. Yeah, I think a mother who's lost their child is definitely more terrifying. than. Yeah, me. and also shot on a micro budget. And I thought it was a very, I don't know, I think Friday the 13th is a clever low budget horror movie. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen, I think two or three of the sequels and they're just terrible. They are awful. And there was like, I think a 20, like a, there was a remake, not a remake. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. it was a remake of the first one in the early 2000s, I think. But yeah, and it went with the Jason story. I thought I was so excited that they were going to go back to the mother thing. Like that was way more interesting to me. You know, it'd be really fun is to do a, like a prequel. Like what happened in the 60s, whatever year that was, that summer. And let's see some other ways that Pamela Voorhees unsnapped. You know what I mean? I don't know. Let's create a prequel. Yeah, definitely. Jason Blum, get on that. Thank you. <laughs> so why do you think that people who seem perfectly sane like you and I uh, love this genre so much gosh Allison that is the age old question because horror is a genre that really gets a bum rap yep um, and yet I'm excited when there are times when even like say the New York Times will have to admit you know what this one's really good like when uh, the Times liked The Conjuring. I remember The Times also liked this little movie that was so good. I think it was 2009 called House of the Devil. Oh, I haven't seen it. Oh, wonderful. It is really good. And it's shot to feel like an 80s horror movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit of a slow boil, but the payoff in Act 3 is oh, so good. It's just, it's, it's, I like, I'm not sure I like a, a chill up front, like, to set things up, but this movie is a slow boil and that really gets me too. Like The Witch, you know, The Witch is, you got to invest into that or Midsummer. you know, those are slow boils. And by the time you get to act three and all hell breaks loose, you're like, whoa, so worth it. Why do I love these movies? I like the thrill ride, maybe for the same reason I like roller coasters. Uh, I like being terrified, but at the same time, you know that you're safe. So it's a safe terror. It's not real terror. I don't, you know, our brain knows that it's not real. Our brain knows that it's fake. But it is, to me, one of the most perfect escapes in a movie theater. A, a, an escape from my life. A, a good comedy does that too. I mean, I'm a huge comedy buff and I'm a bit of a comedy snob because I hate cheesy bad comedies. But the same thing with horror. You know, I like really good ones. It's a, it's a perfect escape. Yeah. So you said that you're a sucker for creaking sounds in old houses. Have you mm -hmm. ever lived in a house or an apartment that had creaks or weird noises? I grew up in a very old house. And because of horror movies, I couldn't remember which ones specifically. But I remember the first time my parents left me alone in the house. I was maybe 10. And they were across the street. <laughs> and this is pre-cell phone, all right? This is, I think, pre-cordless phone. And they were across the street at Mr. and Mrs. Hurst's house and at a party. And it's like, Georgie, you're going to be fine. We're going to be across the street. And our house creaked. And it was old. And it was built in, like I want to say, like 1920, maybe earlier. I don't know. And yeah. It was the fall, wind was blowing. I was because of, you know, for the same reason maybe people are afraid to go in the ocean is because of Jaws. The setup of my experience with horror movies 
made my house to me as the as, uh, that night, my first time alone in it. Very scary. Do you think it was haunted? No. I wish it were. Gosh, that would be fun. Have you ever been anywhere that's supposedly haunted and experienced anything? I think yes. I think the short answer is yes. And I think I might have experienced some kind of presence. There was a house. I went to Boston College, as you mentioned. And my freshman year, I lived in a part of campus called Upper Campus. And the upper campus of Boston College is built on the grounds of this beautiful Tudor mansion. I, you know, it's, I, it, and as mansions go, I would say it's a smaller scale mansion, but it's a, lo- it's a grand old house. And these days, you know, when I was in school there, it was a l- real house and, you know, rich people live there. The founder of Rexall Drugs lived there. There was a murder in the house and a child died in the house. I know that before Boston College acquired it. But students all said when we got there, oh yeah, O'Connell House, which is what the house was called when the school bought it. O'Connell House is haunted. And I was really skeptical, but I was with friends in the house one day and I felt something very cold pass through me. Yeah, but somebody, yeah, there was a murder in the house and a child died in the house. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a ghost walk walk through you or vice versa. Yeah, I think that's the closest I ever came. And I also think shortly after my father died, I was in that house that creaked and scared me when I was home alone for the first time. And my father died when I was 19. And it was a few days after he died. And I was in my bedroom and a light in my room kept flickering. And I said, Dad, is that you? And it flickered faster. That could be a coincidence. I don't know. It's probably not. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, you watched 31 horror movies in 31 days in October. <laughs> I tried to do the same thing. I only got to 27. But what were your favorite movies that you picked and what were your least favorites? And did you discover any new movies? Well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, Allison. I didn't watch one every night. The okay. purpose of those posts, you know, through, the, through October, the Halloween month, was to share with followers suggestions and they're horror movies. They're all movies I've seen. I didn't necessarily watch them that night uh, when I posted it. And yeah, just to share with people, if you're looking for something scary, this is a really good one. Some of those picks, they're my favorites and you can't, you know, 30 is not, 31 is not nearly enough nights to cover like really good horror movies. You'd need several months if you're gonna do one a night, maybe even a year. Well, (laughs) not that many, but I love, what were some of my favorites? Alien, The Conjuring. I've mentioned that and I think I posted that. It Follows. Have you seen that? Yes, I saw that in theaters at Lincoln Center when it came out. I saw it in the theater too. Yeah, so Terrifying. I thought it was really well done. Yes. And very clever, you know, really inventive. And there are others that I didn't post. Oh, there's one one of my favorites, uh, the original Suspiria by Dario Argento. Have you seen that? I haven't. I've just seen the remake I watched a few months ago. It was mm-hmm. really weird. It is weird. The original is weirder, but in the gr- in the really good way. Um, I'll send you an article that I read about it that really kind of captures what's wonderful about it. Okay. Um, hopefully, I don't think it'll ruin your impression of it. But uh, Suspiria is so off the chart crazy, um, and very beautiful to look at. Argento's use of color and light, not primary colors. There are like these hues of greens and reds and pinks and or I mean, it's in yellows. It's, you know, yeah, it's trippy. It's a it's a head trip. There's a movie that I didn't post that I really like that also I love an underdog. Speaking of haunted houses and creepy, uh, the filmed version of the long running play called The Woman in Black. Yes, I saw that um, when I was studying abroad in London, like 13 years ago. I love that. And the movie was good, too. Yeah. So you saw the stage production. I did. I saw the stage. A friend of mine was in it here in New York. An actor named Keith Baxter was in a production downtown in the village. It was the only time I'd ever been in a theater where something legitimately scared me on stage. I know. And it's so simple. Yeah. It's a really simple sort of like sight gag, as it were. And it's very effective. Um, But I like the movie. The movie is just this very old fashioned bump, things going bump in the night kind of a thing. And I think the modern horror fan might look at it and go, ugh, boring, where's the blood? It's not about that. That movie is creepy, creaking things, a ghost. I love that shit. Yeah, um, I've been on a gothic horror kick lately. So that definitely falls into that. And I was watching, I was watching Sleepy Hollow last night. Uh Uh-huh. So I love that movie as well. Good choice. Good choice. Yes. 
Um, so as an actor, you've appeared in shows like Sex and the City and Law and Order CI. And um, have you ever appeared in a horror movie before? God, no. And I would so love to. Yeah. If anybody is listening to this and wants to cast me in one, I would love to be in a horror movie. I think there are probably a lot of laughs in a horror set. And oddly, conversely, like on a, on a comedy set, maybe not as many. I don't know. Yeah, well, horror sets are supposedly not that tense. Like you right. might think that they're supposed to be tense because they're filming this horrible movie, this horrifying movie. But um, my friend Megan that was on, I think episode four of my podcast, she was on the set for two films in London. And she was mm -hmm. like, it wasn't really scary at all. And we were filming in like abandoned underground tube tunnels. So yeah. yeah. Oh, I would love to do one. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Slasher or psychological? What kind of substance? Any of the above. Any of the above. I love, um, and with horror, I don't know if you're, uh, this was coming up later or whatever, and I don't want to jump any guns here, but there are things about the subgenres of horror, different subgenres that I like and some that I don't, you know, like I love things. Well, I love the anchored in reality ones, like where it's just people, things that could happen in real life that can be terrifying, like Halloween. Like there's nothing supernatural there that could actually really happen. That's very scary. So could Psycho, which is also based on a true story. Chainsaw, Psycho, and Silence of the Lambs all come from the same real story. What is that story? Because I don't think I've heard that before. There's a guy named, was a guy named Ed Gein. Oh. I want to, mm -hmm. yeah, and Ed Gein murdered women, I think just women, I could be wrong there, and would sometimes take their skins off oh, and would use the skin to make like lampshades. He was creepy and very sick, obviously, but that was real. So that real, you could, you could Google Ed Gein, it's G-E-I-N. There was an attempted movie about him, a horror movie uh, that was terrible, not even worth seeing the trailer for it. He is the, his story is the basis for Chainsaw, Silence of the Lambs. That's where they, like, the skins thing comes from. So what are your favorite subgenres in horror? I like some of the zombie genre. Okay. Like, I, there are some zombie new movies that I thought were really good. I liked, like, I, I don't know if I would consider I Am Legend a horror movie. Yeah, I think it counts. I guess, yeah. I, the zombie effects seemed a little fake to me. That was a bit of a bummer. But the story, like the movie itself, I thought was really good. And the way that New York was portrayed was one of the few movies that actually got New York right geographically. Yes. Like everything, everything tracked. Like his going from Times Square to downtown. Like, yep, that's where that is. That's where that is. Like, because they so often get that wrong. I also like, I like the slasher ones, but certain slasher ones because, like, I love what Wes Craven did with Scream, especially Scream Two, which I think is the strongest of the original trilogy now quadrilogy because there's so much humor in it. Yes. There's a lot of room for good dark humor in it, and pop culture references, etc. And like an, uh, I guess World War Z, again, is that, a, is that a horror movie in some ways? Yes. It's basically a pandemic movie. Yeah, it is. But there are horror pieces to it or um, elements to it. I love a psychological like uh, horror movie like um, Hereditary or, God, Hereditary was horrifying. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Hereditary, It Follows is falls under that, but there's a little supernatural going on there. As with, and same with um, The Shining. Did you see the, uh, is it room 247? Or is it's it the room number? about that room? In about, it's, about the, it's a documentary about the movie and different theories about what the movie means. I haven't, but I will have to go track that down. Yeah. I saw The Shining when I was in high school, and I've said this on a different episode before, but I think the reason why I did not like it is because my friend and I rented it from Blockbuster, and we put it on and we like fast forwarded through the opening credits and then we watched the whole thing and we're like, what is going on? And then we got to the end of it and it's like, thanks for watching the making of the movie. Now stay tuned for the uh, main presentation. And we're like, what? <laughs> we're like, okay, we just saw the making. So we just saw the behind the scenes of the entire movie. So we know what the movie is about and we know it's going to happen. Oh, oh, I still don't know what it's about. He's always been at the hotel. He never left the hotel. Is he caught in a loop? Like, I don't know. I have no idea. Did you see Dr. Sleep? Yes. Did you like it? I did. More than I thought I would. Yeah. I, I had very, I, when there is some treatment of a, such a revered classic, I go in with very low expectations. Yeah. I think and I was. Everyone was. Yeah. 
I was very pleasantly surprised. So speaking of you like horror that could happen in real life mm -hmm. during lockdown, have you watched any pandemic movies? I rewatched World War Z and I also rewatched, oh gosh, Steven Soderbergh's pandemic movie. Contagion? Contagion, yeah. Yeah, that's a really solid one. I like that one a lot. Very well done. Yeah. My gosh. And I also borrowed a little bit. You don't expect Gwyneth Paltrow to buy the farm so quickly into it. Yeah, just like uh, Drew Barrymore in Scream. And Janet Lee in Psycho. So do you have any favorite horror directors? Uh, yes. Uh, Wes Craven, John Carpenter, Stanley Kubrick. Hmm. Ty West. What has he directed specifically? Ty West did... Oh my gosh, I think Ty West might have, gosh, does he have an Annabelle under his belt or am I thinking of someone else? Are you thinking Ty James Wan? James Wan, thank you. Oh, Insidious, Insidious, I thought was so clever. Oh yeah, no, I really liked Insidious as well. And there are other ones that, pop, like, did you see um, Your Next? Yes, so good, that's actually, that's a Ty West movie. I'm looking at his Wikipedia page now. I yeah, that's why I'm thinking of Ty West. And I'm also, um, there's one that's out uh, recently, like this year. <laughs> I'm like blanking on the title because I'm old and I'm getting senile. The Tales from the Loop is what it says for 2020? No, 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 no. Um, it's about a girl who marries into this family and it turns into this game, this murderous game. Oh, Ready or Not? Thank you. Yeah, I love Ready yeah. or Not. Always so I did too. And again, so much dark humor, because I thought parts of that were hilarious. Yes. Oh, yeah. There was so much hilarity in it. It was directed by Matt ben Benelli Open and Tyler mm -hmm. Gillette. Yeah, that one was great. And Samara Weaving is so good. Have you seen The Babysitter? No. Worth it? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's sort of like schlocky horror a little bit. Um, it's very, I think it's more reminiscent of like, 80s horror. Maybe some people are going to yell at me, but um, it's like, there's a lot of like fake looking blood and Okay. Oh. Well, it's hard to get right. They always make it too light. It's dark. It's almost black. Um, yeah. I'm not a huge film of movies like Evil Dead and stuff like that, so it wasn't exactly for me. But mm -hmm. I thought Cabin in the Woods was a blast. I have tried watching that twice. I saw it in theaters once, and mm -hmm. I was like, I hated that they gave away what was going on so soon, but I know, I knew with my second time watching it, that was the point. Mm -hmm. I tried watching it again. I think in March or April, I watched it again. And I still, I was just a little bit bored. So it's I might hard. To... Those movies, there's some of these movies, and this is what I think, this is unfortunate about what gets lost when we're not in a theater. When you're in a theater with an audience and this is, you're, you're enjoying this shared experience and you're all in this together and some energy comes through the room where you all get to laugh so much more and you, it's like the ride is so much more enjoyable. And I think that's one of those movies. I saw Cabin in the Woods in a theater and I remember a lot of laughter. And also the laughter is a tension reliever. You gotta pop that balloon, you know? And smart directors who know how to pace that sto a story very well, put those in the right place. You know, like, okay, we just went through something really tough. The audience needs a laugh here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Have you ever had any noteworthy experiences seeing a horror movie in theaters? Mm. Not that I can recall. No, I mean, there's some popcorn flinging, but that's just like literally people jumping. You know, when there's a jump scare, yeah. you know? It is fun to be in a movie theater with people who don't have the tolerance for horror movies that I might, because I'm so, like, I have a black heart and I'm calloused, but um, <laughs> it is fun watching someone who, someone be terrified, you know, and covering their eyes and jumping and literally screaming. That's, yeah. That's part of the roller coaster ride. That's what I love about them. And you don't get that when you're watching it with one. Well, you can get it with a couple of people watching at home, but not by yourself. Yeah, definitely. I remember going to see The Ring uh, for a second mm -hmm. time when it was in theaters, mm -hmm. and I was just watching the audience. I was still a little bit scared myself, but at least I knew what was going to happen. So. Yeah. yeah. A scary movie. It's such a good movie. Yes. Well, I can't wait to like. I don't know when this is going to be, but I can't wait to get back to a cinema experience with horror. Yeah, I thought theaters were going to open in, at limited capacity in New York sometime soon, but I guess, mm, I guess Cuomo no. changed that. That, it's for the, bet, for the best. I probably, I definitely not go anyway. Me neither. I, yeah, I, I, I go all in, you know? When I go see a horror movie, I get the popcorn. I get, here's my drill. I will get the feed bucket of popcorn 
and good luck trying to get me to share it. Um, peanut M&Ms, Twizzlers, and some kind of beverage. Now there's this like trend where they were doing like, um, you know, movie theaters that give you like a more exclusive experience where like they will serve you dinner. And I've seen, I've been to a couple of those. It's all right. I just want popcorn and candy and, so, and soda. Like I'm old school that way. That's the theater in Brooklyn, uh, the Alamo Draft House, those mm-hmm. types of places. Yes. I, I've actually never been to one of those, but no. I keep hearing. I don't mind a bar. Like the Metrograph downtown is fabulous. Like I don't mind a bar. If you're going to have a, if you can have a cocktail and bring that into the movie, fine. But I don't want to hear people's silverware clanking on their plates while I'm watching a movie. Yeah, that sounds annoying. It is. So we have an election coming up on November 3rd. And even though it will be over by the time this episode comes out, do you right. think what? That's right. When this comes out, we will have a hopefully new president. I'm hopefully. just going to say it. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think watching horror movies is helping you cope with election day anxiety? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, you know, because as I said, they are the ultimate escape. Um, And I don't mind being terrified because if it's a really well-crafted story, if it's a good script and it's well-directed and well-performed, it can really take me out of my life for 90 minutes or two hours. And we all need that. You know, as I said earlier, a good comedy can do it too. Um, Horror just does it in a different way that is perhaps a bit much for some people, but I love that thrill. I, I always have, ever since I was a little kid, as I was saying. Definitely. It's so fun. And there is a whole, I mean, people have done documentaries and written books about the psychology of what horror means and suggesting that, for example, there seems to be a crop of better horror movies in, time, in times of political strife in our country. Oh, I've never heard that before. That may be true. Like in the 70s, there is a correlation, things like that. And what they mean, like Nightmare on Elm Street, like the subtext, the deeper meaning of horror movies. Stanley Kubrick definitely got to many of them in The Shining. A father wanting to kill a son, patricide, hatred for your wife. Like, just like there's a lot going on in that movie. Um, isolationism and other horror movies are maybe not that complex <laughs> like prom night <laughs> prom night is not that deep you know but at the same time I, I have no problem with a horror movie that is not necessarily deep but all but just well crafted I like a good ride I'm game for both really because I go all in like I just like I lose myself in it I'm like let's go yeah. it has to really suck for me to be annoyed do you think there was any subtext with the original movie, The Omen? I was actually just watching it before mm-hmm. uh, we got on this call. So, cause I had never seen it before. Oh, Richard Donner, the director who also directed Superman with Christopher Reeve, uh, among many other things. He, it's funny you mentioned that. I watched, cause I have some of these DVDs and you know, these are movies that I've seen many times. And so I will half watch it with the commentary on. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially when I used to work at home. Uh, and he doesn't seem to think that, like, it was just another movie to him. So, I eh, like, is he trying to say something? I'm not really sure. He's just trying to tell an interesting story. Yeah, I think he definitely did it. So I found it oh, for sure. Same with The Exorcist um, and William Friedkin. Yeah. You've seen that, yeah? Yes. Yeah. I think Blatty, William Peter Blatty, might have been just trying to say something with the book. I'm not really sure. I've heard theories about who that movie really is about. <laughs> Specifically, I heard someone tell me that the, um, that, uh, the Exorcist is based really on Shirley MacLaine. Hmm. Because the actresses, if you look at, if you look at um, her in that movie, she kind of looks like in terms of her hair and stuff, that's what Shirley MacLaine looked like at the time. Her name in the movie, her character is Trish McNeil. Trish McNeil, Shirley MacLaine. Shirley MacLaine had a daughter. She was an actress who worked on, like, at, um, you know, on location. She had to be away from home and she had a daughter and it kind of, did it coincide with her dive into spiritualism? Did something happen? Was, did William Peter Blatty, the writer of the book, The Exorcist. Is that what he really wrote it about? I don't know. (laughs) Someone just threw that at me as a pet theory, but you know, there are certain things in that possibility that actually do track. So I don't know. I actually listened to a podcast about the making of The Exorcist. It's called Inside The Exorcist. And it was really interesting. Um, It's 
they said that it's based on a true story of a kid that was possessed mm-hmm. in the same way. Yeah. So yeah. the kid wouldn't talk to the person making the podcast. He apparently hung up on him. When he got a, call, a hold of him on the phone. Really? But yeah. He didn't want wow. to pay attention. So. And I heard it was a boy. Yes, it was a boy. Right. Mm-hmm. And the priest who did those, the exorcism, I mean, the, uh, the, um, the two priests were Jesuits. And I went to school with Jesuits, and those, it doesn't surprise me. Apparently, it takes longer to be a Jesuit than it does to be a doctor. I mean, they really, the Jesuits, as the priests, the different orders of priesthood go, there's a lot of school involved, you know, in terms of their education and whatnot. The Jesuits really do a deep dive. Yeah, Fordham is a Jesuit school. Mm-hmm. So they're very big on, you know, education as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like if I had a kid, I would put my kid in a Jesuit school if I could, if I could do it, you know, it was worthwhile for me. The Exorcist is fascinating, but I don't, did you, there's a, there was a little series on Shudder about cursed movies, you know, like Poltergeist with uh, Heather O'Rourke had died and then Dominique Dunn, who, you know, the older teenage daughter had died. Is the movie cursed? Dominique was murdered. No, these are just things that happened, you know, was the set of the omen cursed? I don't necessarily believe that, no. (laughs) Things happen on every movie set. Yeah, that's true. Uh, do you remember the name of that documentary? Uh, there is that. Uh, there is that sort of horror movie app or network called Shutter. Yeah, I have that. And they Shutter did. It's a Shutter production, and oh. each episode is like maybe thirty or forty minutes. Um, I think Linda Blair actually participated in the one on The Exorcist, and it just riddles the question or plays with the question: Was this movie cursed? because of things that happened around it, you know? And really, there were some things that seemed a little creepy, too creepy to be coincidental around the making of The Omen, but at the end of the day, mm, I think it was just a coincidence. (laughs) Yeah. All right, well, I'll have to look for that on Shutter. Yeah, it's worthwhile, it's fun. Yeah. (laughs) Because I'm a nerd. Aren't we all? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So your your satire videos are addressing the Fox News rhetoric that New York City is a war zone right now, which it is not. An article came out in July that said that horror movie fans are handling lockdown better than people who don't like horror movies. Why do you think that is? It's harder to scare us. What is scary to you and me, it, it, I think like you and I, Allison, and anybody who's interested in listening to this and anybody who's interested in horror movies, we don't scare as easily. Yeah. You know, we're a little conditioned. We're a little conditioned to, yeah, <laughs> a little jaded. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's- and also it's, it's horror, as I, I've said this a couple of times, a horror, a well-crafted horror movie is a wonderful diversion, you know? Do protesters scare me? I was working the whole time, full time at my job, taking the subway during the protests and the quote unquote riots, the looting. Yeah, that narrative, no. If you're listening to this and you think that New York is a war zone, it's not. It's very It's nice. quieter. And, you know, there are things about it that I really miss. It ain't the same. I have my problems. They're all pandemic related. No, it's not a war zone. Yeah. <laughs> not a ghost town either. No, definitely not. <laughs> So as we know, there are lots of ghosts in New York. What's your favorite haunted site in New York City? Oh my gosh, no one has taken me to one. I'm actually gonna need your help with this. I know that there are some haunted places in New York and I would like to, I would actually like to talk to an expert in the paranormal and tell me what are some of the hot spots. Okay. Um, Cause I've never had in New York, the experience that I described at O'Connell House at Boston College when I was a freshman. I would love to. And I think, like, in, do you know about some of them? I do, but they're all apartment buildings that are, like, fancy that you can't just walk into. Like, oh, so- I know what I can tell you. Like, Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, the Dakota. It's not the Dakota in the novel. The Dakota no. is the stand-in in the movie. The real movie, or the real uh, building is, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. It is on 7th Avenue and, like, 58th Street. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, there's a fancy, fancy Russian restaurant called Petrosian. Okay. On, I think, 58th and 7th, or it might be 6th Avenue. Um, it's in the Petrosian is on the ground floor of this building where Ira Levin's novel was based. And there was apparently, I, I, maybe there was a coven in that <laughs> building once upon a time. Hmm. I don't really know the for sures about that. So the, the Dakota really was just the... Um, in the movie, yeah. but in the story, it's called the Bram or something. But Ira Levin's, the apartment building 
in Ira Levin's book is the other one I was just talking about. Yeah, but the Dakota is also itself, it's haunted. There is like, I think you will often, people who live there say that they see a little girl in hallways asking, like playing with her toys or something. Wow. Um, and then there's also the apartment building. It's on one of six in Central Park West. It is, you would know it if you saw it. It's round and it kind of looks like a castle. Mm -hmm. um, they're all condos now, but it was the, 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 um, the country's first cancer hospital. Hmm. So, and it's all around. There are no like 90 degree angles because back in those days, they thought that that um, sickness hid in corners. Hmm. So a lot of people died there. So it's been, I think Gothamist did an article once a couple of years ago where Interesting. they talked about how haunted it is. It is. I don't know. Have you listened to any of the Bowery Boys podcast episodes about Ghosts of New York? You can find no. out a lot of information there. I'm so behind on this. Do tell. <laughs> um, the one that I can think of right now is, have you ever been to the clothing store Coss or Coas down on, I think it's Spring Street or maybe Prince? Mm -hmm. um, if, you go in, if you go in and you go to the basement, which anyone can, anyone can because it's a clothing store, mm -hmm. you will see a huge brick well. And I think it's boarded over on top, but back at the turn of the 18th, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there was the, um, a woman was found dead in that well. And so now they think, now there have been multiple occasions where people have seen ghosts in that building. It was a restaurant once and the wait staff used to always see, uh, like see things and get tapped on the shoulder by nobody. And yeah. Yeah. I've th see these things happen to everybody else but me. Like I used to, I worked in the restaurant business for years. I worked with a guy who used to work somewhere. Might have been the townhouse restaurant on the east side. He used to work at. And he said that there was always there was somebody there was a ghost in there, and that he they used to see him in mirrors or something like that when they would close at night. An old man, oh. you know. But they typically like as as legend has it, these things appear or ghosts linger because they have like some unfinished business or some harm came to them and they weren't ready to, like they were taken before they weren't ready or something, and just adds up to unfinished business and they just linger. But it's never, I've never, I've never personally experienced it. I would love to. Maybe I have seen a ghost and it was so real I didn't know it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen a ghost. Knock on wood, I don't really want to because then I would freak out, um, especially in my apartment. Um, I recently heard that if you look, if you see a cat looking into nowhere and looking at nothing and you look, you get down on its level and you look in between its ears, you'll be able to see what they see because um, it's most likely a ghost. And I have two cats, but I will mm -hmm. never be doing that. Sometimes they do stare at nothing, so. Dogs do too. Maybe try looking through your dog's ears. Yeah, they smell things and see things that, yeah. well, their, their nose is, you know, far more sensitive than ours could ever dream of being. And they smell and sense things that we don't. I just hope, I would love to have a ghost in my apartment. I just hope the ghost is hot. Like that would be so great. Cause during lockdown, right. Like during the pandemic, like since no one, like there's no, since intimacy is off the table, <laughs> I would love a visit from a super hot ghost. <laughs> you know, like maybe 1970s Burt Reynolds is gonna come over or 1962 Sean Connery now. No, too soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rest in peace, Sean Connery. <laughs> uh, I hope if a ghost hears this and comes to visit that they're nice. That they're yeah, nice. be nice and let's just hang out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, I would, I would in, in all seriousness, I would love to experience something like that. I say that now. It might change my life for the worse for the, <laughs> forever. Um, but it's never, to my knowledge, happened to me. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast recently where a medium was on and she says that we all have the ability to speak to ghosts and spirits and whatnot, but we have to protect ourselves by saying a prayer for protection beforehand and then then think about somebody that we've lost or that we know and the, they will come through if like you're like lost something. You'll be like, say the protection prayer and then ask that person for help and it's supposed to work. I haven't tried it because I've seen too many horror movies, but- Like Host. Yes, yeah. It's <laughs> exactly what that movie's about, man. It's about them doing it wrong. Because yeah. we were always told, like, don't ever play with a Ouija board alone. Yeah. You, 
other people to anchor the energy or something. I don't know. The Oculus. Yeah. Have you watched Oculus on Netflix? Yeah. Yeah. Such a good movie. Yeah, yeah. Very good. And so is um, Oculus and um, there was a Ouija movie, but the sequel was better. Like two was better than the first one. Ouija. Ouija, Origin of Evil? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Better than expected. It was something that I saw. I saw it on a lark. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, this was legit good. <laughs> Wasn't cheesy. Because you always have to kind of half expect that. Yeah. Because often that is the case. Yeah, those are both Mike Flanagan films. And he's mm-hmm. he's killing it. Yeah. Have you watched it. Hush? No, worth it. Oh, wait, yeah. Hush, about the blind woman in the house? The deaf woman. Or I'm sorry, deaf, wrong. Jeez, George, wrong sense. Yes, mm-hmm. I did. Another one that revealed things too soon, though, I thought. I liked it. I really did. But we saw the bad guy too soon. I wanted to hold off on that a little bit, but I, l- I did like it. Not to take away from that. Uh, I would also suggest Gerald's Game. Which I loved. Okay. So you've seen it. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have a couple more questions. What movie are you most upset that has been postponed because of COVID this year? What horror movie? Halloween Kills which is not it's delayed till next year. And then there's a third one in the pipeline called Halloween Ends. Yes. I want to be in Halloween Ends. Since, since Halloween Kills is in the can and done and done, <gasps> maybe I could get a gig on Halloween Ends. I'd love to be in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder who's doing their casting. I'll find out. Are there any horror movies that you love that people generally don't like? Oh, I'm sure of it. Um, gosh, I got to really think about that. I am one of the few, I have very few friends with whom I can go see a horror movie with. You know, I'm generally, I have to drag people. I let them know my friend John is into it, but like, we can't do that now. And my friend Rob and I used to go all the time. We lived in the same building and we would go to horror movies together. Um, Always fun to see it with someone. Horror movies that I like that people generally go, ew. Well, Friday the 13th. Everyone thinks I'm an idiot for liking that movie uh, because they think it's stupid. But as for reasons I told you before, I thought it was a very, sure it was a Halloween spinoff, but a well-crafted, humble production about a, a grieving mother who went off the rails. Yeah, you definitely made a convincing case for it. Yeah. Yeah. If you could remake one horror movie, what would it be? Oh, if I could remake one horror movie. Oh, did you ever see Gus Van Sant's remake of Psycho? He did like a shot for shot yes. remake of it. Yeah. It's not horrible. I just thought it was pointless. I didn't think... Um... Vince Vaughn. Yeah, I didn't think he was very good. No, he's too big. That Norman Bates should be like Anthony Perkins. He's got to be sort of slim and skinny, wafy. Like an incel. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> like Vince Vaughn was like a little too like dare I say hot. Like yeah. I would have a hard time believing that that guy couldn't find sex somewhere. Like yeah. Let's see a movie that I would like to see remade. Friday the Thirteenth, but I want to do it like. Like a real remake, and there, because there are some blunders in it, it's not a perfect movie, but that that is a great example of teenagers in harm's way, away from any help. And I would set it in 1980 or whatever before cell phones, because that whole tired like I can't, I don't have, I, I, I do you have a signal? Like, you know, that's right, that's right up there with I'll be right back. Like, oh God, how many times are we gonna, you know? Oh, we don't have a signal. Sure. It was a little more believable when we didn't have cell phones. Yeah, I've heard people say that I know what you did last summer would mm-hmm. not, it, it just wouldn't have worked if they had cell phones. No. Yeah. That movie was okay. Yeah, it's fine. That was, in a, that was a sort of like, the, the 90s had a, you know, a spurt of horror movies starting with Scream. Yeah. And that, that was one of them. There was a movie that I would like the first half of it, I should say the first like 40, 30 or 40 minutes of it is so genius to me. And also speaking of no cell phones, When a Stranger Calls. Ah, yes. You've seen that, yes? I have, yeah. Carol Kane was an unknown actress who carried 40 of the most tense minutes in horror movie history all by herself. That movie is all performance. What she has to play 
is incredible. I just watched that, that opening sequence again. Like that, for, it's like the first act of the movie. I didn't like the rest of it. I didn't. I, I think. It, I think it was originally conceived as a short, mm-hmm. and then like then it was expanded into a full length feature, which I didn't really like. But that first half hour or forty minutes or whatever it is, when she is by herself in that house, is so terrifying. And she carries that whole thing by herself. Yeah, she's responding to, to things like the phone ringing. And then when the cop tells her that the call is coming from inside the house, like, I don't know how old you are, but like, I remember when we could do that, you would call 555 and then the last four digits of your phone number and another line in your house would ring on the same, like another phone in the house would ring. That's how you did that. Oh, okay. And everybody knew that. And that's what was so scary about it. And then to find out that, the, that it was no joke that the guy was upstairs in the kid's room and that the kids were dead. It's been a you know? while since I've seen that movie. I might have to rewatch it. But watch, like, I would love to see a re... I don't want to tread on Carol Kane's performance because it is so good. You know, she is the babysitter that you care about. We, mm-hmm. we, want, we want to take care of her. You know, she's not the sort of slutty one, the prom queen that we want to see die, the one that we all hated in high school. She's the girl we liked. And she was in danger. And that's, a lot of horror movies kind of get that wrong. They just want to see a basic, you know, you know, paint by numbers B slasher, or that get, gets made a lot. That's why we loved uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. You know, she was the girl we cared about. You know, the final girl, as they say. But it's nice to see, you know, a movie with characters that we care about and you don't want to see harm come to them. And even sometimes harm does come to them. Jaws did that very well. You know, we got a lot of time with those characters. We got to know them and like them. Yeah, same thing so, with Poltergeist, the family in Poltergeist. I loved that family. They were adorable. Jo Beth Williams, the mother, so good. She was so good. Poltergeist, bad remake, bad. That's what I've heard. It's, yeah. And I like those actors, but it was just not a good movie. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Friday the 13th, I would like to remake, but make it well and kind of give it justice, because I think it's a cool story. <laughs> like, I'm in the minority there, but yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Last question. If you had to spend quarantine with one horror villain, who would it be? Ooh, one horror villain? Ugh. Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> so he could cook for you? No, I would have my own food delivered. Hannibal Lecter only killed people he had contempt for. Like, he killed... Like, that's why I thought Hannibal, the sequel, was not particularly terrifying for the Clarice character, because if Hannibal is loose, she's quite safe, because he likes her. She's not in danger. Yeah. He, he's, he's protective of her. No, he's charming. <laughs> he's funny, and he has taste, and I would learn a lot from him in terms of, like, what makes a good cellist in the orchestra? Because I think it's in one of the, it's in the book where like he, he murdered, you know, killed and ate part of a cellist because this one cellist was compromising the sound of the symphony. <laughs> like he just, you know, so he killed people out of contempt for them. I think Lecter would be a perfect gentleman and I would try to be someone for whom he had no contempt because I'd want to stay alive. That's a very bizarre answer. Like who would want to hang out with Hannibal Lecter? Like, when he's not behind plexiglass or um, bars. Other people have said that, and they've said this so that he could cook for them because he's a good cook, but they wouldn't ask where the meat came from. I, I, well, I don't eat meat, so maybe I'm safe. Maybe he could cook for me and just give me the vegetables, but you got to ask yourself, where's the sauce coming from? So, uh... yeah, I don't eat meat either, so that wouldn't be a problem for me. All right, well, thank you so much for being here. This is so much fun. I really appreciate you taking the time. It is my pleasure, Allison. Thank you so much for asking. This was fun. Do you want to tell people where they can find you on the internet if they want to follow you? Sure. There is my sadly neglected blog at georgehan.com with which I promise to re-engage and write some things. But I'm also very active on Instagram and Twitter where my handle is georgehan, G-E-O-R-G-E-H-A-H-N on both of them. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I actually deleted my Facebook account. Good for you. Thank you. I recommend everyone do it, actually. Yeah, I need to. Very liberating. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Allison. 
that's it for this week's episode of who's there that was so much fun to talk to him i hope you enjoyed my conversation with george and thanks again to george for taking the time to chat with me today you can find links to his website his instagram and his twitter in the show notes as always we'd really appreciate it if you would take a second to rate and review us on apple podcasts and subscribe to our feed wherever you listen it really helps people find the podcast when we have more reviews so we really appreciate you taking the time you can follow us on Twitter at Who's There Pod or on Instagram at Who's There Podcast, or you can feel free to shoot us an email at the Who's There Pod at gmail.com if you have any questions, comments, concerns, horror movie recommendations, or you'd like to be a guest. You should also check out our new website at www.whostherepodcast.com. It was created by Jody Webster at Websterville Designs. You may recognize that name because he was our very first guest ever. Until next time, stay scary and wear a mask.